So let us consider uh, V is equal to real matrices, right? N cross N real matrices and look at, you know what this is? This is called the trace, sum of the diagonal entries of a matrix, okay? That's the trace of a matrix. So you have A and B, two matrices, all right? They get mapped to trace of A, B transposed. This is also an example of an inner product over the space of matrices. If you change it, now we will introduce complex. <coughs> Again, you can take the pair of matrices AB, complex matrices, and they can get mapped to the trace of A, B Hermitian. When I say Hermitian, it is basically the transpose of the conjugate. So, B Hermitian is defined as Take the conjugation of B and then it's transposed, <coughs> right? That is also an example of an inner product. You can go ahead and check that there are square integrable functions, okay? So this, that's also a vector space by the way square integrable functions. So square integrable functions are those such that if you integrate them f t squared d t is going to be bounded. Yeah, so this is a vector space of square integrable functions. So you take L squared and L squared to let's say R. So these are square integrable real functions <clears throat> and you can integrate them from minus infinity to infinity F T G T D T. Okay. F and G getting mapped to this is also an inner product. All right? All right. Let's take the case of continuous functions over some interval in R. So real continuous functions over some interval I where i is some interval over the real line, all right? So that's also a vector space. And you can just see that if you take f and g and you let it be mapped, let's say some lambda, some generalization, you take the integration over the interval i you have lambda t, f t, g t, d t for lambda t, which is positive over i. Okay, that is also an inner product. So you see all these are exotic vector spaces and yet they all share this common property that they have an inner product. So inner products need not necessarily look just like those dot products that you've seen over Euclidean spaces. Rather anything that meets those four properties which we have defined or identified with inner products qualifies as a legitimate inner product over the corresponding vector space, right? So now we will define inner product spaces. 
and it's quite straightforward. Any vector space V over R or C having an inner product, say, this defined on it is an inner product space denoted by V along with just this inner product, right? So we put those two things together and that becomes an inner product space, right? So we've seen what essentially definition of an inner product. We've hopefully grasped some essence about its properties, what it entails and all, and how to check for whether a given function is an inner product. We've also now seen that any vector space armed with this uh, notion of an inner product, of course for that the vector space has to be defined only over R or C, that's a prerequisite. But once it is armed with an inner product, it passes off by the moniker of an inner product space, right? And we've seen some examples along the way. But now we will see certain consequences of a space being an inner product space. It satisfies certain properties. There is certain things about the topology of an inner product space that intrigues us. It allows us to do much of the mathematics in very much the same way that we did for Euclidean spaces. You see, because it can allows us to associate this idea of certain things like angles that we inherit from Euclidean spaces, right? So that is what we shall now look at. So this definition is clear, right? I'm going to erase this definition now. So here is a proposition that I have. Let V with this inner product be an inner product space and all right so this is a function that we are now going to define from v to the field <coughs> given by So what does it do? It goes ahead and picks out objects, arbitrary objects inside the inner product space. Because it's an inner product space, so this inner product is well and truly defined. Because it's going to be positive definite, therefore I can go ahead and take the square root without worrying about whether it's a real field or the complex field. This is always going to be real. And this object is what I'm going to define as this function, okay? So suppose, this is the inner product space and this is the function. So what do we have then? Then, firstly, we have a 
All right? So this is the property of uh, homogeneity. Sorry? Yeah. Thank you. I missed that. So this is the property of homogeneity. Yeah. What other property? Of course, we've already given that as a as a property of the inner product itself. So no surprises that it's going to be a property of the this function as well. What is it? Positive definiteness, right? Has to be. So So again, that's positive definiteness. So even though I'm saying these are uh, parts of the proposition, you should check that there's really nothing much to prove in this homogeneity and this positive definiteness. Why is the homogeneity true? Well, again, by virtue of how it's defined here, right? you're only going to take the positive square root so you take alpha, alpha v and alpha v, right? It's just going to pull out that alpha and alpha squared. If it's complex, then it's alpha and alpha conjugate, which is still the square of the moduli of alpha. When you take its square root, you just get the moduli of alpha out. Yeah, so the homogeneity, whether it's real or complex field, doesn't matter. So these two are really nothing much to prove. The first non-trivial property that this function exhibits is the following. Can you guess what this is? Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So Actually, there's the name, a third name also often associated, the name of Binet. So Cauchy Binet Schwarz inequality, CBS or Cauchy Schwarz, whichever way you like it, right? So I still write it as the CS inequality for all V1, V2 belonging to V. <coughs> yeah? This is celebrated Cauchy Schwarz inequality in Euclidean spaces. This turns out to be the fact that cos theta is less than one and you're done with the proof, right? But we will prove this, of course, for general vector spaces. And it's very, very powerful because now, after we have done this proof, I would urge you to go back and look at those different inner products that we have defined just a while back on some of those exotic vector spaces and apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality corresponding to the inner products that have been defined on those spaces. And then you'll begin to see that all of them do not look like that uh, Euclidean space and those inequalities may be quite a handful to prove, particularly the ones with traces or the integrations of those functions and so on and so forth. And yet, because of this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, they are as true as the inequality that you manifested in terms of dot products when you studied Euclidean spaces. Right? The fourth important property, this is also another inequality. Can you guess what inequality? Triangle inequality. So we have V1 plus V2. Yeah, what is this? The, the triangle inequality basically says the sum of two sides of a triangle is always going to be greater than the third side, right? They can be only equal if it's a degenerate triangle when they're all along the same line, right? <coughs> V1 
right. So, this is the the triangle inequality. Not sure if we will get there to the end of the triangle inequality today, but at least I will try to prove in whatever time is remaining, try to show you the proof of the Cauchy Schwarz inequality in today's lecture and close it there, right. So, these are the four properties. The first two I put it to you are straightforward for you to verify, follow from the definition itself. So, the Cauchy Schwarz inequality is what we shall now try to prove, all right. So, consider this particular object. Okay. What can we say about this object? Of course, it is going to be positive, non negative at least. Yeah. And I am totally agnostic to the choice of field that is whether it is real or complex. All we are going to use in this proof is just the properties of inner products. So, what is this? As per our definition of this function that we have not named yet, but now we can actually call it the norm. So, this is the square of the norm, right. So, what is this? We know how to define this in terms of an inner product, right. So, this means that the inner product of V1 minus V1 V2 times V2 upon norm of V2 squared and V1 minus again the same object v1 v2 is v2 upon now you might think that oh hang on suddenly he's brought in this humongous looking expression from out of nowhere again of course because i know how the proof works so i just uh, up front i proposed it but there is also some intuition behind this if you think of and nowhere better than to start our intuitions from Euclidean spaces that we understand. So, what is this? When you take the inner product of a vector with another, the dot product of a vector with another in the Euclidean space, what is it that you are exactly doing? You are looking at, you are projecting that one vector on the second vector, right. And then, if you are dividing it by the length of the second vector, then what you have is essentially the length of the first vector or the projection of the length of the first vector on the second vector, yeah. And then if you are multiplying it by V2 upon the norm of V2, it is like the unit vector. So, you are basically taking that length along the direction of V2, yeah, and you are subtracting it from the original vector. So, just think geometrically in Euclidean spaces at least, what sort of an object this vector represents. Sorry? Exactly. So, that is all that the argument starts from. So, so long as there is this orthogonal comp component, some non zero orthogonal comp component, we should be able to show the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. If it is, if it vanishes altogether, that is, those two vectors are aligned to begin with, then you have equality, right? That is the intuition. So, this huge looking expression is not just pulled out from thin air, but also there is a good amount of intuition behind this. So, now let us go, go, go ahead and carry out the algebra with this. So, what is this? The first term with the first term here that is just V1 with respect to V1. When we take the first with the second, remember there is a sesquilinearity to be considered because it is not necessarily a real inner product space. So, we have to accommodate that possibility, right. So, this object is actually a scalar, either a real or a complex number, right. So, we have to 
accommodate that possibility. If we do that, then what, what happens to this? Minus V1, V2, but this object will come out. But because it comes out and it is a scaling factor of the second argument, so what do I have to do? Conjugate. Of course, there is nothing to conjugate in this. The conjugate will only show its effect on this. Right, so this is V1, V2, the conjugate thereof divided by V2 squared. Yeah. So this with this comes here, this with this comes here. Now I need this with this. Of course, I do not need to conjugate anymore. Why? Because this is, of course, the coefficient of the uh, scaling factor of the first argument. So first argument, it doesn't matter. It's completely linear in the first argument, right? So I have minus v1, v2 upon v2 squared, the norm squared, that is. And this is v2, v1, v2, v1. But this v2, v1 is bugging me. So I'm just going to flip the order and take the conjugate so that these two terms end up looking similar. You agree? So I might ask you to do this in one more step, but I will just use the fact that I can delete chalk marks easily. Agreed? Clear? Last plus, of course, this fellow is unaffected, but this fellow will come with its conjugate. But what happens when you multiply a fellow with its conjugate? It's the square of the moduli of that fellow. So what you have essentially is V1, V2, the moduli, the square thereof, and V2, the square and square, so it's the fourth power, but on top here you have, so this is what? V2's norm squared, which is greater than or equal to 0. Yeah? But what are these after all? Again, this is the same as this, is it not? because it's just x and x conjugate, x and x conjugate, and this is also x and x conjugate, which is a moduli of x squared, right? So I'm going to erase this first line and continue here. So you agree that this term and these two, these are exactly the same terms. Only that one of them will cancel out with the other, leaving only just one of those negative terms behind, terms with the negative sign behind. So in one shot, I'm now going to write this as V1 squared, because that's what this is, right? V1 squared. And this and this will cancel out. So let me just cancel this out with this, so that I'll be left with just one of those terms, minus From whence I can infer upon taking this appropriate square root right. 
So irrespective of whether this is the real field or the complex field, the cauchy schwarz inequality is true. And we've used nothing other than just definitions that we've introduced earlier in the lecture today. Any doubts on this? Otherwise, uh, we'll put, a, put an end to this discussion here today. Sorry, in the? Here? Here? This one? This? This one? Yeah. This one? So what I'm doing is I'm taking this with this, and then I'm taking this with this. So when I'm taking this, this is the first argument, this is the second argument, and the second argument is carrying out, carrying, uh, I mean, carrying forward this scaling factor. So that when it gets pulled out, its conjugate has to be pulled out, right? Because that's exactly what denies it from being uh, bilinear. If it's over the complex field, we have to accommodate the possibility that it's not bilinear, but sesquilinear. In the second argument, it is not completely linear, and it's this scaling factor. So when this gets pulled out, it doesn't come out by itself, it comes out with its conjugate. So that's what brings out this conjugate here. Right? Okay, thank you.